If you have your Bible, we're going to be in John chapter 9. You can turn there um, or use your phone, your Bible app, or there's a Bible in the pew rack in front of you. John chapter 9, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We're in the middle of a, a, a series that's taken us through the end of the summer through the, through the book of John. And so that's where we'll start. John chapter 9, we're going to we'll read the, uh, the whole chapter. Um, so if you want to find your way there. Now there's a lot of arguing going on these days in our world. Um, people are arguing about all kinds of different things, and, and this isn't a new phenomenon. There's, there's been arguments and debates uh, as, as, long as, as long as we can remember. Some are, some are big, serious, serious types of debates that, 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 were, that have to do with our world and with our country and, and with everything that's going on. Some are, some are less serious things, debates that you might have in, in, in the coffee shop or or when you're doing, playing a round of golf with someone, or you're just out and about with your family. There's, there's stuff that's happening, and, and, and people have, have um, their, their side of, of how they see things are going and the way that they think they should, they should go. The other side will try to dispute it and say, no, that's wrong, here's the facts, or, or here's, here's something that, that, that you're not considering, or well, what about this? And so it goes on and on and on and on, and there's, there's debates and arguments all the time. And here's, a, here's a, a, from a recent, um, a recent debate that, that basically kind of divided our country, and, I, and I, brought a, I, I brought a picture there to show you. And so if, if, you, if you, you may or may not remember this, but, but I remember this. Um, this was the 2014 divisional playoff between uh, your Dallas Cowboys and uh, the Packers of Green Bay there at Lambeau Field, and this was the fourth quarter. Uh, fourth down and two, actually, um, and everyone's expecting probably a run to DeMarco Murray, but instead, uh, Aikman drops back, uh, Dez goes down the sidelines for a fade, uh, Romo throws it, right, perfect spot, right, to the back of his helmet where Dez can jump up, catch it, pull it down, great catch, they mark it, the referee marks it there at the one or two, I can't remember, anyway, and so I'm, I'm jumping and I'm, I'm screaming, we're having a good time, looks like we're going to win this game. Then, the replay, the replay comes and then, um, and then, hang on. <laughs> and then they said it wasn't a catch. <laughs> and everything changed. Yeah. They reversed it. Uh, so the, the thing about this whole play was, um, if, if and some of you look at that and go, who, who, what is that? But for those of you who kind of follow the sports world, this thing was talked about over and over and over again. It was replayed over and over. It was on talk radio. It was on, on sports, you know, ESPN, all the sports stations. It was a catch. It wasn't a catch. Everybody had their own opinion. By the way, it was a catch. Let me just go ahead and say that right now. But here's the, yeah, amen. Now, um, let, me, let me kind of transition here just a little bit. So there wasn't, there wasn't a lot of football going on back in Jesus' day. So there wasn't a lot, of, a lot of controversy coming that way, but there definitely was a lot of controversy in the time when Jesus was walking this earth, and a lot of it had, had to do or really centered around him. There was a lot of debate about who he was. Um, he made claims, a lot of claims about who he was, and those claims really weren't received all that well by most people. They had their reasons why they didn't like him, um, why they didn't believe in, in him or believe who he said he was, why they, why they, they thought he, he really wasn't who he said he was. But when, it comes, but when it comes down to Jesus and when it comes to him, there are some things that you just absolutely, you just cannot deny. There is no argument. And we're actually going to talk about one of those uh, this morning in John 9. But before we can read the, John chapter 9, um, I, I want to give you just a little bit of background. And we have to, and we have to read John chapter 9 with John 8 verse 12 in mind. Um, and, and here's what that says. Chapter 8 verse 12, it says, Jesus tells the people, I am the light of the world. Anyone who follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So a, a couple of things about that statement there. When the people heard Jesus make that statement, they all would have remembered Isaiah the prophet. Okay, because this was, this was in their scriptures. They would have remembered Isaiah, and Isaiah describes the Messiah as the light for the nations who brings salvation to the ends of the earth. So when Jesus says to the crowd that he is the light of the world, he's, he's saying, I am the Messiah. This, that's me, the one who was promised by God to make the world right again. 
And not only is, is he the promise, but with his comment saying that I am the light of the world in John chapter 8, he's also claiming that he is God. Because in, in the Old Testament scriptures, there's, there's constant, um, several mentions of God in, in calling God the light. So he's not even claiming that he is God, but he's claiming the authority of God. And, and you see Jesus doing this throughout this book of John, and, and you see his authority and power. And what Jesus kind of does is he does sort of a, a mini replay of the life and times of the Israelites when they were leaving Egypt, when they were leaving their captivity, and, and, and God had set them free. Um, you, you see in John chapter 6, he feeds, Jesus feeds the 5,000. We know it's 5,000 men, not counting women and children, so some estimates are 10, 15,000 people. But he feeds them miraculously with the fish and the bread. And this mirrors how God miraculously fed the Israelites through, through manna, from, from the, the, bread of, the bread of heaven. And so it's, and he, uh, Jesus, we see him also, he crosses the sea. He's walking on water. He's, he's miraculously walking on the water. And this mirrors the way that God uh, miraculously led the people of Israel across the Red Sea. Now, Jesus walked on the water, but uh, the great miracle that God did is was he parted the sea so that the Israelites could cross over in dry land and the Egyptians weren't able to do the same. And in John chapter 7, Jesus, he says that he, he is the living water, and he invites the thirsty people to come and to drink from him, and they will never thirst again. And that mirrors how, G, how God provided water for the people of Israel through their journey through the wilderness. They, they, the people of Israel, for, for being free, they sure did complain a lot. And one of the times they were complaining was they were complaining that they had nothing, no food, no drink, and God miraculously provides that for him. And in John chapter 8, verse 12, Jesus calls himself the light of the world. And this mirrors God's provision for the Israelites at night when there was, he led the people by fire, this light. He led them by fire at night so they could continue on their journey. You see, the Israelites had, they had to follow God because he was, he was leading them. He was providing for them. Um, and, and this is what Jesus is saying too. He, by saying, I am the light, he's calling people to follow him. He's calling people to come to him because he will provide for them. He will guide them. He will give them direction. So it's in that context where we read uh, John chapter 9. So here we go. Verse 1, as he was passing by, talking about Jesus, he saw a man blind from birth. Remember that. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, uh, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, Jesus answered. This came about so that God's works might be displayed in him. We must do the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, here it is again, I am the light of the world. After he said these things, he spit on the ground, made some mud from the saliva, and spread the mud on his eyes. Go, he told him, he's talking to the blind man, the man born, born blind, wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. So he left, washed, and came back seeing. His neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar said, Isn't this the one who used to sit begging? Some said, uh, He is the one. Others were saying, No, but it, it does look like him. He kept saying, No, I, I'm the one. So they asked him, Then how were your eyes open? He answered, The man called Jesus made mud, spread it on my eyes, and told me, Go to Siloam and wash. So when I went and washed, I received my sight. Where is he? They asked. Um, I don't know, he said. They brought the man who used to be blind to the Pharisees. Um, here come the, the religious leaders of the day. The, um, the day that Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes was the Sabbath. Then the Pharisees asked him again how he received his sight. He put mud on my eyes. He told him, I washed and I can see. Some of the Pharisees, Pharisees said, this man is not from God because he doesn't keep the Sabbath. But others, others were saying, how can a sinful man perform such signs? And there was a division among them. Again, they asked the blind man, What do you say about him since he opened your eyes? He's a prophet, he said. The Jews, uh, referring back to the Pharisees, the Jews did not believe this about him, that he was blind and received sight until they summoned the parents of the one who had received his sight. They asked them, Is, your, is this your son, the one you say that was born blind? How then does he now see? Verse 20 he says, We know this is our son and that he was born blind, his parents answered. But we don't know how he, he now sees, and we don't know who opened his eyes. Ask him. He's of age. He'll speak for himself. His parents said these things because they were afraid of the Jews, since the Jews had already agreed that if anyone confessed him, Jesus, as Messiah, he would be banned from the synagogue. This is why his parents said, 
hey, ask him. <laughs> Leave us out of this. So a second time, they summoned the man who had been blind and told him, give glory to God. We know this man is a sinner. Verse 25, this is the centerpiece. This is my favorite part of the story. He answered, whether or not he's a sinner, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind and now I can what? Now I can see. Then they asked him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? And he's telling him, I already told you. He said, you didn't listen. Why do you want to hear it again? You don't want to become his disciples too, do you? It's kind of going at them. They ridiculed him. You're that man's disciple, but we're Moses' disciples. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but this man, we don't know where he's from. And the blind man starts speaking again. This is an amazing thing, the man told him. You don't know where he is from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God doesn't listen to sinners, but if anyone is God-fearing and does his will, he listens to him. So this man's now arguing the case for Jesus. Throughout history, no one has ever heard of someone opening the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not from God, he wouldn't be able to do anything. Then the Pharisees, they get angry. You were born entirely in sin, they replied, and you're trying to teach us? And then they threw him out. They kicked him out of the synagogue. Jesus heard that they had thrown the man out, and when he found him, he asked, Do you believe in the Son of Man? Verse 36, Who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? He asked. Jesus answered, You have seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. I believe, Lord, he said, and he worshiped him. Jesus said, I came into this world for judgment in order that those who do not see will see and those who do see will become blind. Some of the Pharisees who were with him heard these things and asked him, we aren't blind too, are we? If you were blind, Jesus told them, you wouldn't have sin. But now that you say we see, your sin remains. So here's, here's the main point of, of the sermon, and I'm, I'm going to go ahead and give it to you right now. I'm, I'm going to skip right to it. Uh, matter of fact, as soon as you write this down, you, you're, you're free to leave. But here's, here's the, and, it, and it's actually the fourth point in your outline. And don't worry, I'm going to go back. I'll, I'll go back and catch the other ones. But here it is. You ready for this? Jesus changes lives. That's, that's the whole message today, that Jesus changes lives. I love how this man who was healed in this story, he got fed up with the Pharisees. And finally, he said, look, listen, I don't know what you guys think about him. I don't know what you're looking for. I don't know what you're trying to decide here. I don't know, who, you know what, you, what you believe or don't believe about him. But he said, here is what I know. I was blind, but now I see. You can't argue with that. There's no debate over that. They tried to argue. They tried to discredit him. They even went and got his parents. His parents, like, is this, this your boy, the boy that was born? Boy? They're like, yes, yes, that's him. Ask him. Um, they, didn't want it, they didn't want it to be true, but there was no denying this guy who had never seen before in his life, ever, and now that he can see. And can you imagine? This, this guy was probably... He, you know, just, just sensory overload. He was, he was wanting to catch up with all the time that, that he lost. He was wanting to see things that he'd, he'd only heard about before or maybe even, even touched before. He was finally getting to see the sun. He was getting to see trees. He was getting to see um, some of his family. He was getting to see friends. He was seeing uh, food, animals. Oh, he's seen everything all, all at once for the very, very first time. And he was trying to see it all, but these Pharisees won't leave him alone. They keep bringing him back. And I think that's why he's so frustrated. He says, listen, I couldn't see. Now I can see. And Jesus did it. He's the one that made it happen. So that's all I've got to tell you. That's all I can tell you. Now leave me alone because I've got some major catching up to do. I can, <laughs> I can imagine him going around, hey, have you seen this before? You know, did you see? And they're like, yes, we've seen it. And he's like, well, I haven't. This is amazing. I, I remember when, when Tyler, he's our oldest, um, when he was born, the, the first time that, that I held him and um, those of you who, who've had that opportunity before, um, it, it, was, it, was pretty, it was pretty awesome, right? This is, this is a, your newborn, firstborn. But I knew the whole time that I was holding him, that this little guy, he was going to change my entire life. Everything was going to change. This is, this is going to be different. This is, this is new now. It wasn't just me and Shonda, so it wasn't like just me trying to be a good husband. Now all of a sudden, I have this new responsibility, and I have to be, I have to be a, a, a dad now. And I'm still trying to get, up, get this whole marriage thing on track, and I'm still working on that right now. But then now I've, I've got I've to worry, worry about this guy, too. There's three of us now. 
And every cha- everything changed in our lives. There was no denying it. We had never, ever had a room dedicated to a, to a little baby before in our house. But now, guess what we had? We had a room dedicated to this little man. We, we decorated it with Noah's, Noah, Noah and the Ark, right? The destruction of the world. I don't know why we chose that theme, but we did. Um, and so we just had little reminders of God destroying the world all around his babies. Uh, but remember, he, he restored, okay? Just kidding. Okay, we, we'd never done that before. And, and, and we'd never spent millions of dollars on diapers and, 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 and on food that I couldn't eat and, and clothes that didn't fit me. We'd, we'd never done that before. And now we were doing this. It, it just changed. And I was, I was talking to the, this baby like he could understand. I've never, talking to some, I've never talked to something that couldn't respond or, or couldn't talk back to me. And I was making baby noise. It, was just, it, was, it wasn't me anymore. I didn't know who I was. This, this little guy, he changed, he changed everything. He changed, you know, now when we were going to go somewhere, we had, to, we had a, used to, we'd had a suitcase that would fit our clothes. Uh, and so we had one suitcase where we would go, maybe two. Now we had three suitcases and we had a crib and we had bottles and we had baby toys. And it's like we had to buy a new vehicle to fit all this stuff in. I mean, this changed everything. But you know, that's, that's, what, that's what Jesus does. He, he changes everything. He changes how we live, how we see, how we act, what we say, where we go, what our priorities are, how we invest our time, our treasure, our talent. He changes our perspective, but here's here's the most important thing that Jesus changes. Jesus changes our eternity. We go from, from dark to light. We go from lost to found, from separated from God to to an intimate relationship with God. We go from hopelessness to hope. We go from sorrow to joy, from slaves to sin to to free in Christ. We go from death to life. He changes everything. Galatians 2.20 says, I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. It's, it's not me in control anymore. I'm not the leader. Jesus said that he was the light of the world, not me. It doesn't say that Jimmy was the light of the world. It says Jesus is the light of the world, and that means he is my Savior. He brings me out of that darkness, but it also means that he's my Lord. The miracle of, of the healing that, that this man experienced, this miracle just authenticated what Jesus was already saying. He is the light of the world, and he changes, he changes everything. So what, what are some characteristics of that changed life? Well, let's, let's go back to the top of our outline, and we'll, we'll jump back into John chapter 9. And, and there's some things that I think that this is what a changed life looks like. And the first thing that I, w- I would want to point out from this chapter is, is that our struggles are an opportunity for God's powerful work. Our struggles are an opportunity for God's powerful work. You see there in the passage, at the very beginning, the disciples, they they come upon this man, and the disciples start asking Jesus, whose fault is this? Like, why is this guy blind? Whose fault is it? Was it it his fault? Um, Was it his parents' fault? I mean, this kind of seems like a real jerky thing to do. It doesn't sound really compassionate. Hmm, You're blind. Why why are you blind? What did you do wrong? What did your parents do wrong? But but commentaries tell us that 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 whole idea, this, this thought process that they're having, that came from the legalism that was taught by the religious leaders of that day. And the whole idea was that if, if I did enough good, then God will reward me. I, I earned his love, or better yet, I deserved his love because of all the good things that I've done. But it also means that if I'm not good enough, or I don't do enough good things, then God's going to punish me, or maybe going to punish someone in my family because of I'm not good enough. And it's a, really, it's a really messed up way of thinking about God and his love for us. But unfortunately, it's, it's still a way a lot of people think today. They think that if I, I do good, then God's gonna love me. But if I don't do good, then God's gonna punish me. And that's, that's so opposite of who God is. The reality is that blindness really has nothing to do with his sin. I mean, yes, it has to do with sin because we live in a broken world and because Our world is no longer the way God intended it to be. We do have blindness. We do have sickness. We do have hurt. We do have suffering. So we have all of those things. But I, so I guess you could say ultimately it does, it is sin because of the brokenness of our world. But the point Jesus was trying to make was that through struggles, we can experience some of God's greatest work. In 1 Peter 4, 12, uh, 
1 Peter 4, 12 and 13, it says this. It says, dear friends, don't be surprised at the fiery trials you're going through as if something strange were happening to you. Instead, catch this, be very glad for these trials make you partners with Christ in his suffering so that you will have the wonderful joy of seeing his glory when it is revealed to all of the world. Now that word fiery, it's, it's, a, it's a Greek expression that's used about talking about refining materials, uh, re- refining metals. It, it, it literally means burning and, it, and it's also used for, for a word to describe pain. So one commentary says, suffering is not to be regarded as something foreign to a Christian experience, but rather as a, as a refining test. Struggles, they are hard and they can, be, they can be painful, and there's no doubt that they are. But it is through those very struggles that God is refining us, that he's making us stronger. He wants to, to make us more like him. It's, it's this purification process. And our natural response to struggle, to hardship, is, is sorrow, because it's difficulty. We, we want to be sorrowful. We're sad because we are going through this. But it's also sometimes it's shock. It's like, wh- wh- why, why, am, why me? Why now? What's going on? And, and Peter says that you, we shouldn't see it as a, as a surprise. Matter of fact, he says that we should rejoice. That's opposite of what we think. But he says we should rejoice. The joy, the joy is not necessarily coming from the actual trial, but it's, it's in the truth that we, are, we need to rejoice because we are suffering as Christ suffered and... And, here's the important and, and just like Jesus, we will also share in his great glory. That through the struggle, through what's happening, that God is going to reveal himself to us and he will continue to be with us and walk with us. That's where that comfort comes from and the joy comes from. The struggles are temporary. And some of you may go, yeah, I've been struggling for years and years and years. But I would say this, and and I don't want to diminish or demean or, or anything your struggle but I would say in the scope of eternity, um, what God is saying is, listen, these are temporary, but God and his glory are eternal. And that's where the hope is. That's where, that, that's where we find hope in the struggle. That's where we find joy. I heard a pastor say this one time, and I'm not gonna say it. I didn't write it down at the time. I just remember what he said, and this is not the exact quote, but he says, don't use suffering as a way to say that there is no God because it was in my suffering where I had some of the greatest experiences with God. And he was saying, you, you can't say, well, because there's, there's suffering in the world that there is no God because it was during his suffering, during his dark times, during the trials and struggles that he went through is when he said that he experienced God like no other time before. And some of you have that story too. You hear it from people all the time. It was through, through the darkness in my life that I experienced God's love. I experienced his protection, his peace, his care, his healing, his hope. But what do we normally want to do when we go through a struggle or we go through a hard time or or go through difficulties? We want out. We want out. We want God to take away the pain. We want God to take away the hurt, take away the struggle, take away this trial. That's that's what I've prayed for many times. Uh, When when I've gone through some difficulties, some dark times as as me as an individual and then sometimes as a family when when God is, we've just kind of walked through some dark times. We've always prayed, God, take it away. We don't want it. And here's what I want to tell you. I don't think that that's, that's bad to pray that. Jesus prayed that. Jesus prayed that when he said, God, is there, if there any, when talking about the cross, if there's any other way to do this, please take this cup of suffering, of pain, take, remove this from me. But as you know, he prayed, not my will, but your will would be done. But here's, here's a question I have. What, what would happen if we stopped asking God to remove it and started asking God, what do you want to do through it? What do you want to do through this in me and through my family, for, for the people around me? A changed life sees trial as an opportunity to see God mold us, shape us, and do a mighty work in us and through us. I think another thing we see there in John 9 about a changed life is that obedience requires a journey of faith. Obedience requires a journey of faith. Did you see how Jesus did this miracle? He didn't, he didn't touch the guy's eyes and say, be healed. He didn't make a big show about it, right? Be healed now. Send me money to my TV show. You know, he didn't do that. He didn't do that. And he didn't just say, hey, see. Guy, we don't get this guy's name. He didn't just say, hey, see. No, he didn't do that. In fact, it was a little bit gross what he did. 
but he, he made mud using his, using his spit, and he spread it on the guy's eyes, okay, covered his eyes, made mud, used the mud to cover this guy's eyes, and wa- check this out. Here's, here's what he did. He says, go wash in the pool of Siloam. You see, the miracle, it didn't happen immediately. It didn't happen immediately. It happened after, after he washed. But I, I think about me, and I want results. I, I want the instant results. I want, Jesus, I want Jesus to say, it's all better. Done. Taken care of. We don't want to take the journey. We just, we just want to get to the end. God, just get, get me to the end. Just fast forward. Get, let's go. Let's get to the end. The journey, it's, it's, it seems it's, like it's too long. It's too hard. And, and for some of us, we wouldn't say, God, that just seems really unnecessary. Why not, just, why not just heal him, Jesus? Why not just heal me? Why not just make things better? You, you can say it, and it will happen. Why not? But you know why I, I think the journey is so important? Hebrews eleven six 6 tells us why the journey is so important. You can never please God without faith. Some of your Bibles may say it is impossible to please God without faith, without depending upon him. Anyone who wants to come to God must believe that there is a God and that he rewards those who sincerely look for him. It's faith. Obedience requires faith. That man could have just, he could have just said, well, you know, uh, no thanks. Jesus, I, I appreciate the mud-filled uh, the saliva-filled mud in my eyes, you know, but I'm just going to, I'm going to stay here. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of used to life like this. I, I haven't seen my whole life. I kind of know my journey. I know what I do. I beg people to help me. Um, it, it's okay, but, but thank, you know, thanks, thanks anyway. God's command for us is to follow him his command for us to follow him, to do what he's calling us to do, to trust him, it requires a faith that leads to obedience. And see, you can say, I believe all you want. You can say it all you want. But if you never do anything with that belief, if there's never any obedience, then you have no faith. Because faith requires that action. And I, and I get it. When God, when God calls you to do something or asks you to do something, there is this, you know, I, I don't know what this guy did. It, it, the Bible just says that he immediately... It, basically says that he got up immediately. I don't know what was going on in his head, but for a lot of us, Henry Blackaby calls it this, in experiencing God, he calls it this crisis of belief. And we, we all go through it when God asks us to follow him or to join him. But the only way we experience God is through our obedience. The only way that this man sees is if he goes to the pool and does what Jesus asked him to do. Now listen to this. There is no sight where there is no faith. This guy doesn't get, this guy's not healed if he doesn't take that journey that Jesus sent him on. We don't, we don't get to see if we're not willing to obey, to take that step of faith. I think John 9 also teaches us that selfishness can cause us to miss God's activity around us. Look at verse 16. The, the Pharisees, okay, these are the religious leaders. These guys know Scripture. They, they, they know about God. The, the, these religious leaders, they're, they're so focused on when Jesus did what he did. Scripture told us, John 9 told us that, that he did this on the Sabbath. They're so focused on when he did it and not what he did. You see, the, script, um, the, the Pharisees, they had so many laws. I mean, God commanded that we rest on the Sabbath, but these guys took it to the next level. They had so many laws, so many rules that you could or couldn't do on the Sabbath, what was work. But I, I just kind of want to go, hello, hello, Pharisees. Did you not just see what happened? A man who was born blind, he can now see. Did you guys catch that? Did, did, did you notice that? Do you understand what a huge deal that is? I mean, that doesn't happen every day. Matter of fact, I don't know that that's ever happened. Did you see that? I'm always amazed at people who are, um, I'm talking about sports again, who are at sporting events. And I, I'm guilty of this too. I've done this before. So I'm really, I'm, I'm saying I'm amazed at myself sometimes because of the dumb things I do. But there are huge moments that are happening right in front of them and they're experiencing it how? What are they, what are they look? So this huge moment is happening right now, but how are they experiencing it? Through their phone, right? They've got their phone out and they're recording it. Okay, now I get that some people do this a lot, you know, okay, you've got it. But we're kind of looking, and it's right here. And, and you know, yeah, they want to document it so they can show it to their friends or post it later. I was there or whatever, da-da-da-da. But 
sometimes it just, I, it just doesn't make sense. You, you just want to go, look, put the phone down and just enjoy the moment. Why, why, do, why do we want to see things through this little lens when you can see it happening right in front of you? Because your, your, your vision through the phone, it's just, narrow, it's just it's narrow. You don't get to see, you don't have all the peripheral stuff going on either. And I think sometimes we, we miss God. Like these Pharisees, we miss the activity of God because we're too focused on our own thing. A changed life means that I'm not going to look through my own narrow vision anymore, but I'm going to start seeing the world as Jesus sees it. I want to see him at work. I, I'm going to look for him and, and join him where he's at. I don't want to miss God because I'm too busy, I'm too busy playing God in my life. Philippians 2, 4 says, everyone should look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Paul's telling us, you know, there's a big, big world out there. There's a big world out there, church, and we can, we can get so focused on ourselves, on our own agendas, that we miss God and miss opportunities that he's put before us. Instead of, instead of celebrating the miracle, the, the Pharisees, they're so focused on their religion. They didn't, they didn't experience the joy. They didn't experience the blessing of, uh, of the miracle. Instead, they, they got annoyed and they got angry. Now tell me how that makes sense. You see or you hear about and you see this man come to you and he was blind. He's been blind his whole life and now he can see everything around you. How do you get annoyed and angry over that? How are you not celebrating for this man? How are you not celebrating what's happening around him? The miracle that is. You know how you, how you get annoyed and angry? is when you're too focused on your own self. Because what they had going on it took priority over what Jesus had going on. And that is dangerous, that's destructive, and it's just plain wrong. And I wonder sometimes, what have I missed? What, what have we missed? Because we're so focused on us that we miss him. And finally, I think John 9 teaches us that spiritual blindness, sorry, this is not real good news, but spiritual blindness affects all of us. Spiritual blindness affects all of us. John 1, 8 says, if we claim we don't have any sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. All have sinned. We've all missed God's mark for our lives. We're all in darkness. That's why, that's why Jesus, the light of the world, had to come and give us the way out of darkness into God's marvelous light. The problem is that so many people think that they can see without Jesus, without his intervention in their lives. We can't be free until we acknowledge that we're trapped in our sin and there's nothing we can do to fix it. You see, God gives us freedom from sin through his son, Jesus. Um, Kent, R. Kent Hughes, this, this author, he, he wrote this on about his commentary in John. He says, the Pharisees thought they had it all together, that they had arrived. Through their acquaintance with the law, they knew that they were not perfect, but they did not understand how deeply infected they were with sin. So they adopted the external, experience, the external appearance of having dealt with sin, though actually they had never faced the darkness of their hearts. They were self-satisfied. They said, we see, when in reality they were blind. <laughs> Have you ever been, been out to eat with someone um, and, and you've had this conversation, you've had dinner or lunch, whatever it is, and then maybe in the middle of the meal you, you go to the restroom or maybe it's after the meal and you get into your car and you look in the mirror and you notice you just got this big hunk of something in your teeth. And you're just like, oh my goodness. First of all, you want to go punch your friend and say, why didn't you tell me I had this giant burrito in my teeth here? Um, but it's just, you're just, you're humiliated. You're just, oh, how long has that been there? This whole blah, blah, blah. But you know what? I, I think sometimes it's, it's that way with Jesus. And Jesus is kind of the mirror because we, we think, hey, I'm all good. Life's good. I'm, I'm good. I'm, I'm a good person. Life's good. And we look in the mirror. And what's reflected back is, is Jesus says, you know what, you got, you got something. Actually, it's not there. It's here. It's a sin. And it's causing you to be blind. It's, it's infected your soul. It's infected your life. And you need to get rid of it. When we look at Jesus, we, we see our sin. We see how unworthy we are. But thank God he doesn't leave us there he doesn't want to leave us broken. He wants to give us a new life. One of the great promises God made to us is that he would send a savior to rescue those who were desperate. Jesus is that promise. 
We are all in darkness, but God sent Jesus to be that light, to show us the way. And if we want to be changed by Jesus, we have to recognize our need for him. He changes lives, and he wants to change you, and he wants to change me. He wants, he wants to give us sight so that we can see him for who he really is, that he is God, that he is Lord, that he is Savior, that he is Master. And he, he wants to give us sight so that we can see, um, the way the world, see the world the way that he sees it. You see, seeing means that, that we love God and, and that we live for him. Seeing means is that we tell the world about his love, about his salvation, about his forgiveness, about his new life. And so that, that's, that's what we need to see. We, we, we see that through Christ. But here's what our world needs to see. You ready for this? Our world needs to see uh, Christ followers who, are, who stop being complacent but start living like changed people. We need to see the world through God's eyes, and what they need to see is that they need to see Christ in us. When people look at, when people look at us, they should say, you know what, there's something different. They don't handle anger the way that everyone else handles anger. They don't handle struggle. They, there's, there's a peace about them. They have something different. And I don't know what it is, but I want, I want some of that. You see, because you can't argue with a changed life. And that's what our world needs to see. They need to see a changed life. And when they see that changed life, what we say is, oh, let, me, let me tell you who changed it. Let me tell you who gave me sight. Because before Jesus, I was blind. But now I can see.